5, the verse about God being able to restore the locusts and what the locusts have taken from us. Uh, this morning we're going to pick up where we left off and hopefully go to the end of the chapter, chapter 2. Uh, restoration is what this chapter is about. And as, as Chip rightly said, Joel basically is a book about judgment. It's about, he introduces the concept in the Bible, which many others are going to repeat, of the day of the Lord, a day when God comes and rights wrong, and a day when God judges uh, sometimes his people. Ultimately, it's going to be a judgment on those who are not his people, the last day of the Lord. We're going to pick up this morning in verse 26. Uh, he says, You shall eat in plenty and be satisfied. You will praise the name of the Lord your God, who has dealt wondrously with you, and my people will never be put to shame. Now you'll note, Joel's speaking in a future tense. He's not speaking to the present. He's talking about a day that comes after Joel 2.25, a day when he said that he would restore all the years that the locust you know, has uh, taken away from folks. But in 26, he continues on talking about what that's going to look like. Now, he's talking here in 2.26 about the Jewish people primarily. Uh, he's going to turn a corner shortly and go to the end of time. He's going to talk about the last day of the Lord uh, preceding Jesus coming back to the earth. Now, he says in verse 27, excuse me, let me stop. I want to focus just for a moment on that last phrase that says, my people will never be put to shame. Now, that's an interesting turn of phrase there. I, I don't know if you've ever thought about that, that uh, the people of God can be put to shame. That implies there's an outside group acting upon the people of God, causing them to be ashamed. Now, for Joel's day, that would have been the fact that they lived in sin, the people of God, and were shamed by the invasions of Assyria, they were shamed by the uh, invasions and sieges of Babylon, Persia. They were, rather than being a light or a city on the hill, they were shamed. They were brought down. Uh, people were saying, they'd look at the Jews and they'd say, uh, well, where's your God? You know, why didn't he show up and stop this if he's so great and awesome? God's saying in 26, that's coming to an end. There's going to be a day when I set my people up and they'll never be brought down again. Uh, we've got, in chapters 1 and chapter 2, we've had several things happen. Remember, it started off with that locust invasion that came and ate everything. Then it was followed early in chapter 2 with a prophecy about an invading army coming. Uh, we don't know specifically which army he was referring to. Uh, it was a military shaming of the people of God. Verse 22, uh, 27 says, Then you're going to know once again, are we talking present or future? We're talking future. Then you will know that I'm in the midst of Israel. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. And my people will never, never be put to shame. I love that. That's one of my favorite expressions in the Old Testament. God says it a lot. I am the Lord your God, and there is no other. Amen. You know, folks today believe there are others. <clears throat> they do. We've got world religions, do we not? We have Hinduism, Confucianism, Shintoism, Buddhism, Islam. People think there are others. And the truth of the matter is, there is no other. It's not that there are multiple gods competing for the affections of mankind. There's only one. There is no other. And God is clear about that. Amen. And he says when he comes, when he rises, that his people will never be put to shame again. He's in the midst of them. Uh, I like that. 
I like the fact that God communicates to us that he is in our midst, right? That's one of the reasons we come to church, to be with the people of God. He's in our midst. Old Testament, you remember in the Old Testament when he led them out of Egypt? Uh, he had that pillar of fire. He was in their midst. He was right in the middle of their camp. And when that fire stood up and headed out, they'd pack their tents and they'd follow him. And they'd camp when he settled down at the end of the day. He was in their midst. There is no other God. <clears throat> Monotheism. That's what that implies and teaches. There's one God. You'll occasionally hear somebody say, well, isn't uh, the God of Islam the God of the Christians too? God of Abraham. The answer is no. There is no Allah. There's only one God. And his name, the Lord your God, is Jehovah. That's, that's what he's teaching us here in this text. Now, we come to a, a turning point in verse 28, and I want to really bear down on this for the rest of our time together this morning. <clears throat> Probably, if you did a survey of Christian people uh, of which part of Joel they were the most familiar with, it would be this verse in the following verses because it's repeated very clearly in the New Testament uh, the day of Pentecost the birth of the church mm -hmm. Acts chapter 2 and it's about the Holy Spirit you know the Holy Spirit was with us this morning in our service yeah. he was I could tell those testimonies and uh, the words that were shared, uh, I could feel the presence of the Holy Spirit uh, because people were testifying of doing the work of the Holy Spirit in our, in our community here. Well, this verse, chapter 28, Joel says this somewhere around 800 B.C., long before, 800 plus years before the day of Pentecost, when Peter stood up and preached that sermon. And he says, it will come to pass afterward. What is afterward? Well, after Joel says it, after Joel's talking here, it's going to come afterward that there will be a day that God will pour out his spirit upon all flesh. He says, when he does that, that all of your sons and your daughters will prophesy and all your old men will dream dreams. And your young men will see visions. Now that's a familiar verse to most Christian people because Peter repeats that in the book of Acts later on. Uh, I find it's helpful to try to, to place myself in the context of when this was said by Joel way back there. Because when he said that, there had been no such thing as that experience that I just read. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. Holy Spirit, we know he's eternal. We know he's the third person of the Trinity. We know that he was present at creation, you remember? Yes. Said the Spirit of God was hovering over the waters, brooding over the waters when creation was done. He's always been... But folks in the Old Testament did not have a relationship with the Holy Spirit like you do. That's hard to believe, isn't it? Some of you have been Christians a long time. You've had the Holy Spirit living in your heart for decades. He's never left you. Never left you alone. He's never, he's never uh, treated you like somebody that he'll come to once in a while and then he'll leave and go somewhere else. He's always been with you. Well, Joel's prophesying about this 800 years before the day of Pentecost, and he's describing it. Um, let me read for you what Ezekiel said. He, he talked about the same thing when the Spirit would come. He said, Ezekiel 36, 27, I'll put my Spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes, and you'll keep my judgments then, and you'll do them. So Ezekiel 
he saw something come where the spirit wasn't going to be out there brooding over creation, but he was going to come and live in you. That was something new. They didn't have that in the Old Testament. Ezekiel also said, 37, 14, I'm going to put my spirit in you and you will live. And I'll place you in your own land and you'll know that I, the Lord, have spoken it and performed it, says the Lord. And the same thing that Joel is saying to us, that God's going to do something new for his people. Now, you might wonder, well, what was it like? to be a, a believer back in the Old Testament if it was a life without the Holy Spirit always there. What was it like? Um, when we read the Old Testament scriptures, we, we see lots of instances where the Holy Spirit would come upon somebody. Uh, he would come upon people and they would prophesy. Uh, he would come upon David and he would dance. But the teaching is, is that once he did that, he left. That presence was not with them continuously in the Old Testament. And Job 2.28 says it's going to come a day when he's going to stay. I want to read for you a passage, Acts 2, 1 through 13, where Peter quotes from the book of Joel that we're looking at here this morning, all right? The day of Pentecost had come shortly after uh, the resurrection from the dead, Peter uh, and all the believers, the 120 that uh, had gathered together, they were all gathered when the day of Pentecost had fully come, it says. And they were all with one accord in one place. And suddenly there came a sound from heaven as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them divided tongues, as a fire, and one set upon each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit, and they began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when the sound occurred, the multitude came together, and they were all confused, because everyone heard them speak in their own language. And they were all amazed, and they said, Look, are not all those who are speaking these languages Galileans? And how is it that we are hearing them each in our own language in which we were born? There's Parthians here, Medes, Elamites, those people dwelling in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, Pamphylia, Egypt, parts of Libya, Cyrene, Rome, Jews, Gentiles, Cretans, and Arabs. Yeah. We all are here and then speak in our language. The wonderful works of God. And so they were all amazed and perplexed and they said to one another, what, a, what could this mean? And others said, they're full of new wine. <laughs> no. You know, there's always a party pooper, isn't there? <laughs> you know, God comes, tongues of fire on every head, every known language to mankind is being spoken, makes the Tower of Babel look like foolishness. Yeah. And, and somebody says, they're all drunk. Yeah. They're just drunk. What took place on that day, most call the birth of the church. That's when Jesus in heaven sent his spirit. He sent the comforter yes. to the church down here, right? Mm -hmm. And so those folks that I just read about, up until this day, they were just like all the folks in the Old Testament, that they had a, a fleeting experience with the Holy Spirit. Come and go. But on this day, he came and dwelt within them and he never left them the rest of their lives. Well, this is what Joel's talking about in verse 28, the day when this comes. Uh, as a matter of fact, we know 
that that's the truth because in Acts 2.16, Peter says this when they said that they're just drunk. He said, no, no. No, he said, this is that which was spoken of by the prophet Joel. Yes. Right? Amen. He said, you know, these are all Jews here, right? They knew the Old Testament. <laughs> they understood the Scriptures. And when Peter said that, he's calling them to task. He's saying, you know the Word of God. You know what Joel wrote back there in the second chapter of his book. He said there was going to come a day when God's Spirit would be poured out upon your sons and your daughters and your old men and your young men. And he said, this is that. This is it. It's happening. The day of Pentecost. Now I want to say, uh, just for a point of detail, the day of Pentecost in Acts 2 did not fulfill Joel's prophecy. You think I'm crazy? It didn't. And Peter never said it did. Peter said this is like it. This is that that he spoke of. This is part of it. This is a, a bit of it. This is maybe we could say this is the start of it. But it's not the end of it. Because this prophecy when God pours out a spirit, when that happens fully, it's the end. Amen. It's the end. It is the day of the Lord. When Jesus returns in power and in glory and he vanquishes all of his enemies with the word of his mouth that says, I love that, can't get over it, I never will. With the word of his mouth, he sets up his throne in Jerusalem and he rules through the millennium and then all of eternity with us. Well, this is that that Joel spoke of, Peter says in 2.16. Uh, just to show you I'm not nitpicking words Peter never said that the day of Pentecost fulfilled Joel's prophecy that's my point I want you to see the Bible is deliberate the Holy Spirit is deliberate when he uh, fulfills prophecies and that's, that's a word that doesn't appear in Acts 2 Matthew 2, 17. Then was fulfilled that which was spoken by Jeremiah the prophet, saying in Ramah there was a voice heard, lamentation and weeping and great mourning. Fulfilled. It was done. Uh, later on, Matthew 2, 23. And it says Jesus came, or Joseph came and dwelt in the city called Nazareth, that it might be fulfilled. It was done. Mm. Prophecy was fulfilled. There's no more coming. Well, Acts is just the beginning. The day of Pentecost was the beginning of the prophecy of Joel 2 being fulfilled, the Spirit being poured out. You know what's interesting? Uh, the Jews' Bible's different from ours. Did you know that? Yeah. It's different. Uh, we've got three chapters for the book of Joel, right? In the Jewish Bible, they got four. And it's not extra verses. The same verses you've got. But what they did was, this section right here, about Joel 2, 28 through 32, to them was so important, they made it their own chapter. And after verse 32, verse 33 and following, they made that chapter four. Because... Allow me, departed Jewish brethren, to say, if you've ever tasted the Holy Spirit and he left you, you'd make this its own chapter too. Because it's talking about the fact that God is going to come by his Spirit. He's going to pour himself out on every kind of people, not just kings and prophets, everybody. And more than that, he's going to stay. He's not going to leave you. And that's what we've got. Lo, I'm with you always. That's the way he said it. And that's an experience that perhaps, uh, I think, we, sh we would do well to give a word of thanks to the Lord about. Uh, because we have an experience with the Holy Spirit that uh, lots of folks never had. They were left on their own. 
God would come to them and he would leave. And now we have a new experience. Amen. We've got uh, in Joel 2.28 a section of scripture, basically four verses <clears throat> that that informed or taught the apostles what church was going to be like. That it was going to be a community of people that had been filled with the Holy Spirit. And that's not changed. That's what we are today. Uh, when we have Peter stand up in Acts 2, now I, I think I'm correct that probably no one has been more made fun of in the Bible than Peter. Would you agree? I mean, we always call out the times he sticks his foot in his mouth and just jumps out there and says things that are embarrassing. Uh, and yet, and yet, on the day of Pentecost when the Holy Spirit came, we see somebody different, do we not? Uh, I can I can scarcely read Acts chapter two, the first sermon of the church, without tears. And I think it's because the, way, the reason it moves me so much is because I'm aware of what Peter was, and then I'm aware of what he is when the Holy Spirit comes into his life, and that's me, and uh, that's you. Yeah. We're changed. That's 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 what salvation does for us. To be born again is to be is to be inhabited, to be indwelt by the Spirit of God. And we're not the same people that we used to be anymore. We're not perfect, but we have an experience with the Spirit of God that it's very close to what Peter was like. Because man. When he stood up in the temple there in Acts chapter 2 and preached that sermon to those Jews, he's a changed man. He wasn't a theologian. He wasn't classically trained or any of that. But the Spirit of God anointing him and speaking through him made all the difference in the world. There were several thousand people saved that day when they heard, when they heard the sermon. So uh, Joel is talking about that day the day of Pentecost, and more. Now notice he says there's going to be sons and there's going to be daughters. So it's not respecting gender when the Spirit comes. It's going to ha have uh, this happen to old men and women and uh, young men and women. Mm -hmm. So it's not going to respect age either. Now that might seem of no consequence to you, but I want to tell you something. It is. Because if you study your scripture, you'll quickly realize in the Old Testament this experience only happened temporarily to kings and prophets. Mm -hmm. Guys you might have heard of like Elijah. This was not what common folk experienced in the Old Testament. They went to gatherings and assemblies and saw them up there on the stage have that experience. They didn't have it happen to them. And God is pouring out his spirit upon everybody here. Now, Acts 2, I read that, that first portion to you about the uh, coming of the spirit, speaking in all the languages, and the reaction of the crowd. They kind of interrupted Peter on that day because he wasn't through. Because if you'll read Acts chapter 2, you're, you'll discover he went on and read the rest of Joel chapter 2, <laughs> verses 29 and following. Let me, let, me, let me do that for you. Verse 29. Also on my men servants and my maid servants I'll pour out my spirit in those days. And I'll show wonders in the heavens and on the earth, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. The sun will be turned into darkness. The moon will be turned into blood 
before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord. Did that happen on the day of Pentecost? What I just read? Sun turned to darkness, moon into blood, blood and fire and pillars of smoke. Did wonders happen in the skies? No, it didn't happen, did it? That's why I tried to make a point early on today to say that the word fulfilled does not appear in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2 was the day of Pentecost was the beginning. They're giving us the, the starting point of the day of the Lord, right? But it's got an ending, and it's not going to end well for those who do not belong to Jesus Christ. It's a day of darkness and doom. It's a day of judgment of God upon all those who have purposefully rejected the gospel of Jesus Christ. Mm -hmm. Today we live in a time when wrong gets away with it. When bad decisions and ungodly decisions prosper. Mm -hmm. But the day of the Lord in the scriptures is God making everything right and just and fair. It's a day when he'll correct and remedy all the wrongs that have ever been done. It will come to pass afterward. Afterward. So we're living in an age right now that's called many things. Uh, it's called the church age by some. Day of Pentecost up to now. Uh, it's called the day of man by some. Mm. That's a scary one rather than the day of the Lord. Uh, uh, the day of uh, the Spirit. It's called the age of the Spirit. When the Holy Spirit's here, Paul says he's going to leave one day. He'll be taken out. Well, Peter's talking about the, the fact that Joel 2, 30 and 31 tells us the end of the age is going to be darkness and judgment blood. It will be a great and terrible day of the Lord, he says. That's, that's harsh. Very severe. It'll come to pass afterwards. Verse 29, he says, <clears throat> Also on my men servants and my maid servants I'll pour out my spirit in those days. I like that because uh, that's us little folks. You know, He's, he's talked first about uh, men and women. He's talked about old folks. He's talked about kids. And now he just talks about working people. But he's going to pour his spirit out on everybody. And that has been our experience, has it not? Hmm. Have you seen it? Have you seen it in your Christian life? All kinds of folks can get saved. Again, you don't have to be a particular kind of person to get saved. You don't have to be well educated, or you could be a person with many degrees. You can be rich or poor, <clears throat> retired, working. You can be a little boy, a little girl, mm -hmm. and you can be saved. That's what Peter is describing when he quotes Joel. He's saying, God's going to pour his spirit out on everybody, all kinds of folks. There won't be any distinctions of what kind of people that can be saved or not. And we've all witnessed that, I know, in living our Christian life. Uh, we witnessed it this morning when they talked about some of the ministries of this church, the pregnancy center, the mercy clinic, and things like that. Those are just common folks that come in off the street, and they're like you when somebody tells them the gospel, Holy Spirit calls them and they give their hearts to Christ and they be, they're saved. Those little children over George C. Clark, same thing. Little children can understand the gospel. You don't have to be an adult. You can hear it as a child and, and know that Jesus is calling you to be saved. Well, that's what will come to pass afterward and we're in it right now. Now, he says, sons and daughters, old men, young men, male and female servants. So he's trying to just paint the picture. Everybody's welcome. God's going to draw everybody in together. No differences in sex, in age, or social standing. That is the gospel. It's meant for everybody. Now, 
trying to place ourselves back, if we will, to the day of Pentecost when Peter stood up and began to preach. That that was a, a world gathering of Jews. Those all those countries I tried to to read, hard names some of them. What what that list was, it, it's not an accident. Scholars have taken that list and laid it down alongside the Roman Empire. And that list <coughs> included someone from every province of the known Roman Empire. In other words, the whole world is here. They're here in Jerusalem to celebrate the day of Pentecost and God poured out his spirit on the Christians and gave them Peter's sermon. That's not what they came for. That is not what they expected. They expected to go into the temple and sacrifice animals and then go home and commit their sins. They didn't realize that God was moving in a new way that day, but they soon found out. You know, the day of Pentecost is the beginning of evangelism. It's the beginning of people coming to Christ. From that sermon on the steps of the temple that day until now, we've had some 2,000 years of Christian work around the world to bring people to Christ. That's possible because of the Holy Spirit. Uh, I, I'm amazed as I study the Bible at the Holy Spirit because, you know, God proclaims his name to us all through Old Testament and New. Adonai, Jehovah, Yahweh. Jesus comes and is born to Mary and Joseph. His name will be called Wonderful, Counselor, the Mighty God, the Everlasting Greece, Prince. And so his name's big. But do you know the Holy Spirit's different? He doesn't talk about himself. He's different than the Father and Son. Jesus said when he comes, he'll convict the world of sin and righteousness and judgment. He said he'll, he'll not talk of himself, but he'll reveal the things of, of, of me to him. That's what he does. Uh, we're not taught to pray to him, although I don't think there's anything wrong with it. Pray, pray to the Lord. He wants to point you to Jesus. He wants you to know what Jesus is like personally. That's why he lives inside you. He wants, he wants Christian people to understand that the Spirit of God indwells us in such a fashion that if we confess our sins, pray, read his word, and walk with him in obedience, that we can have an experience, a personal experience of knowing Almighty God. He's our friend, and he reveals Jesus Christ to us. That's what Peter was announcing. That's what Joel announced. Joel gave Peter the words to say. Mm -hmm. All right? Now, we'll, let's go over to uh, verse 32. <clears throat> this is the net result of the Holy Spirit coming. Joel said, it will come to pass. In other words, it's out there. It hasn't come yet. It will come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Amen. Thank you, God. Thank you. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem there shall be deliverance, as the Lord has said, among the remnant whom the Lord our God calls. Well, you know, there you have it. Right there in 850 B.C., the oldest writing prophet in the scriptures, you have got the announcement that the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is coming, and there's coming a day when whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now I like to I like to quote this to people that I'm sharing the gospel with when I get through. Because sometimes people say, Well, I didn't feel it. Or I didn't have this vision. You know? Everybody's different. Some do, most don't. 
But what I can always show somebody is this <coughs> promise in prophecy in the Word of God that says, whosoever calls upon the name of the Lord will be saved. And I'll ask them, did you call on the name of the Lord? And they'll say, yes, I did. And I said, well, what are you? And they'll look at it and say, well, I'm saved. And I believe they are. Well, Joel gives us this, this truth. This is new in the Old Testament. Before this, it never had appeared that there's, there's going to be a time when whoever calls on the name of the Lord will be saved. Now, Peter quoted it in Acts 2.21 on the day of the birth of the church. He said, It will come to pass that whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now, there, you know, there's always an old grouch in every group. There's somebody that wants to say, well, I know, but that doesn't apply to me. You know, that's, that's for those old Jews. You looked at me when you said that. No. <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, Peter said that, and Joel said that to Jews. And so you might say, well, that's just for the Jews. That's not for me. I'm a Gentile. Well, it just so happens that the Apostle Paul came along. <laughs> Romans 10, 12, and 13. And he said, there's no difference between Jews and Greeks or Gentiles, for the same Lord is over all of them. To all those that call upon him. And then he says, for whosoever will call upon the name of the Lord, they shall be saved. And he that's a very deliberate sentence construction by Paul to say it's Gentiles and Jews. Yeah. There's nobody that's born in this world that cannot be saved. This is an expression that started with Joel through Peter on to Paul and to every great preacher that's ever lived since then. We understand. We understand that when Jesus died on the cross and he was buried and he rose again on the third day according to the scriptures that he instituted the gospel of Jesus Christ and that whosoever will call yes. upon the name of the Lord will be saved. I like what he said Revelation 22, 17 Jesus said this remember it whosoever will let him take of the water of life freely. Whosoever will may come. I don't know how it can be any clearer. Jesus repeats what Joel said in Joel 2.28 through 32. That's the gospel. Well, thank you all. We'll finish right now, but uh, next week we're going to do chapter 3. Next couple of weeks, I think. We'll do chapter 3 of Joel. Amen. Father, we thank you this morning for the lesson of the scripture, the verses, the words. We thank you for those that have gone before us, Joel, Peter, Paul, all the preachers and teachers we've had in our lives, Lord, that have repeated these words to us. We thank you for a Bible that we can place in our laps and read any time that we want to. We thank you for preserving your word through the years. We thank you, Father, for the Lord Jesus Christ and his sacrifice on the cross for our sins. Uh, we owe you everything, Father, and yet we realize we can't pay you back for what he did. It's all your grace, Lord. It's your grace, and we ask that you'll place your Holy Spirit upon us this week. Allow us to be your servants to prophesy and dream dreams and have visions and share your word with everyone that we come in contact with. For we pray in your name. Amen. Amen.